She was born into polygamy. Her family followed the teachings of Joseph Smith, including plural marriage. Like many young girls, she had been promised to a man who was her father's age. But she ran away. She chose hell over a life of polygamy. That girl was me. I was lost, alone, desolate. Then Jesus Christ found me and rescued me. In his love, I found real freedom. He is a shield to all who will take refuge in him. This is why I can look back and ask, polygamy, what love is this? Welcome to our program, Polygamy, What Love Is This? I'm your host, Doris Hansen, and we are bringing information to you so that you will be able to compare biblical Christianity with the Mormonism that Joseph Smith invented. Of course, it was Joseph Smith who introduced religious polygamy into American culture, and he is the prophet for both the LDS as well as for polygamy groups. Following the two television shows uh, that Lynn Wilder and I did on sexual abuse in Mormonism, we received so many stories from our viewers who were sharing their experiences of, of abuse that they had suffered in either the Mormon church or in polygamy groups. And one uh, victim of sexual abuse was actually in the live audience at the television studio. And she subsequently agreed to be interviewed on our program to tell her story of how the Mormon priesthood authority was invoked to force her to submit to the abuse. And so we've invited her here and here today to tell her story. I would like to introduce and welcome former Mormon Vicki Anderson. Hello, Vicki. Hi. Thanks for coming. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> We've got lots to talk about. And Vicki, uh, you're very brave and courageous to do this, but your story is important to be told by the people who are listening, and we hope there's a lot who will see this. Vicki's story is long, and so we're going to be broadcasting her interview in th a three-part series. Vicki was sexually abused by her priesthood-holding father from the time she was an infant. And we know that telling this story is difficult for Vicki, but she has also discovered that through Jesus Christ, she has the strength to talk about her experiences and indeed talking about them, telling the truth will set her free. And perhaps telling her story publicly will encourage others who may hear what she said and inspire them to speak out against this abusive religious system that systematically hides sexual abuse and caters to the priesthood holding abusers, whether it's in the Mormon church or in polygamy groups. And if you're watching and you or someone you know is being abused, call someone, get some help. Abuse is not God ordained. No matter how authoritative your abuser lords it over you, abuse comes from evil, not from good, and it is illegal. And if you need help getting help, Give us a call. We can point you to safe people, and if you're in a polygamy group, we can help you get away from your abusers. Our telephone number is 385-240-2888. Now, be sure and leave a clear callback information if, you'd, if we don't answer the phone, but the number again is 385-240-2888, or you can contact us by email, tv at aboutpolygamy.com. Okay, Vicki, let's, let's talk about your life, <laughs> Okay, your story. We're going to begin with when you were young, but first of all, talk about your abuser. Who was your abuser? Tell us about him, and how do you know you were abused at such an early age? Okay, well, he was my biological father. He was a priesthood holder, a temple recommend holder, and a police officer in our community. And we were able to pinpoint the abuse when I went back into therapy as an adult, and I was sharing some of my earliest memories that happened about four, age four, mm. and the therapist said because of my response in those memories, it was clear that it had been happening quite a while before that. Mm. And there was also reports of him um, molesting 
the girls that would come to babysit me at mm. that time. Oh my, oh my. So, but, you, but your first and your earliest memory, actual memory of uh, the abuse, was at, was at what age? Age four. Eight, uh, four years Around old. You four. actually remember mm -hmm. uh, his abusing you. Now, did you have female siblings and did your father abuse them as well? Yes, I have one younger sister who's uh, three years younger than I am and uh, he would he would abuse her when I wasn't around. I was mm -hmm. the favorite, I was his first choice, but if I wasn't there and she was, then he would abuse her so as well. So was this a daily event? Was there a, a rhyme or reason or pattern when he would do this? It depended on his work schedule because as a police officer and other jobs he held, he had different shifts and how busy my mom was involved in the th church and how often she was gone. But I would say on average, about three to four times a week. Wow, wow. Now the question that everyone wonders in a case like this is, did your mother know what was going on? And if she did, what was the response? Did she con confront your father? What was her reaction to you? And what was his reaction when he knew that she knew? Well, I remember specific incidents where my mom came into my bedroom and asked me if my dad was doing these things to me, and I nodded my head, yes, he was. And she said, well, if it ever happens again, you be sure to come and tell me. A few days later, my dad came into my bedroom and said that I wasn't to tell anybody, especially my mother, because that would destroy our eternal family. He would be sent away he would end his life if I wasn't in it. He wouldn't have any reason to live. And my t siblings would grow up without a father and it would be because I told about our special relationship. So he put the whole burden of the guilt on you. Yes. Not to tell, not to yes. tell. Um, now, did he, um, did he use his police, uh, his position as a police officer as part of his um, manipulating Oh, oh yeah, because he was wearing his police uniform. He had his belt strapped to his waist and he took the gun out of the holster and he put it in my hands and said that he would use this if I told. Use it on you or on himself? On himself. Um, but then when I was an adult, my mom shared um, her experience at that time and he told her that it was her responsibility, according to the scriptures, to forgive him seven times 70, mm. or she would be guilty of the greater sin. And that not only would he take out his own life, but he would take us girls with him. Oh my. So she kept quiet. She figured it was the lesser of the two evils. The lesser of the two. And, and that's typical of abusers to, to place the guilt you know, there'll be a terrible disaster and it'll be all your yes. fault Yes. Uh, to keep you quiet. Now, yes. your father took in foster children. Um, in fact, one time he took in a 15-year-old boy. Tell us about that story. Yes, so because uh, he was a teenager and we were young, uh, he was allowed to babysit us when my parents went out. And my father's edict any time he left the house uh, was that we were to obey this brother, this foster brother, uh, just like we would obey him, that he would have the same authority and we would have to show him the same respect that we showed our father in his absence. And so my brother, foster brother acted as my father. And uh, so when we were left alone with him, he would either take me or my sister in the back bedroom and we would obey him just as we obeyed Oh goodness, and did that go on for very long? I think it only went on for about a few months before my sister got upset and told, and then my dad exploded. Uh, he was immediately removed from our home, mm. and my dad was quite angry at me for allowing it to happen. Oh, really? Which created a lot of confusion in my little eight, nine-year-old mind that, but I was being obedient to mm -hmm. you by obeying him and couldn't see the difference between what he did to me and what the foster brother did. So there's a lot of confusion that, that comes from this, and we're gonna talk a little bit later, um, probably the next show, on, on how Mormon doctrine you know, kind of, uh, helps um, uh, incubate and, and precipitate this kind of behavior. But there's a lot of confusion in your mind at this age yes. of what is going on and 
and, and who you should obey and and who's more important to obey your mother or your father yes and was your father or was your mother excuse me when she found out she just told you come and tell me the next time it happens but you never came and told her the next time it happened did she was she curious or did you think she was afraid to pursue I more think information she, I'm of the opinion that he, she was just afraid. She didn't know where to go and what to do with that information. And my dad could be very threatening. Yeah. He would follow through on his threats. Yeah. Um, did her position or his position in um, Mormon callings or in the LDS church, do you think, had anything to do with um, her fear? Uh, was she like under his authority and, and did he tell her to be quiet? Oh, and yes. so she had to obey him as, as the yes. authority in the home. Yes, he was the priesthood holder, the patriarch. He was the final word, and she had to submit to him. So he had you afraid of him. He obviously had her yes. also afraid of him. Yes. What about your younger sister? Was she afraid of him? Uh, yes, but she, she had a good relationship with my mother. So when she couldn't handle it anymore, she would tell my mother, and then that would put more pressure on me to make sure that my father didn't get to her because then she would tell and everything would fall apart. Mm -hmm. Now, this may be a, a difficult question even to go back this far and, and answer. I know a lot of people, uh, they grow up in abusive situations and they think it's normal because they don't know any different. And with you having started this at such a young age, did you think this was normal? Did you know that there was something wrong? Uh, how did you? I felt you... I felt that there had to be something wrong with it or it wouldn't be a secret. If this was going on everywhere in every home um, and it was in accordance with God's will, then it would be more open. So there was a part of me that knew that this, this wasn't right, but since it had started at such a young age, I didn't know who to go to or what to do with the information, and so mm -hmm. I just stayed quiet. Mm -hmm. I see, okay. All right, um, well, let's talk now. You're, you're, this went on for many years, many years, and you're coming to the age of eight where baptism is going to be a big part of your development and of your growth in the Mormon church. And you become accountability. This, of course, is, is what happens. Um, everything happens after you're baptized is what lays on your shoulder and you are guilty and, and all of this um, destructive, I call, doctrine yes. that they believe in. Um, so about time that this baptizing was approaching, you had started having a death wish. Yes, Would I you did. Explain that? <laughs> Um, my father started preparing me for my baptism. He quoted me a scripture out of the Doctrine and Covenants that um, inasmuch as parents have children in Zion and teach them not. Now this is Doctrine and Covenants. I think it's going to go on the screen. So you can go ahead and quote it. Doctrine and Covenants 6825. It says, and again, inasmuch as parents have children in Zion and teach them not to understand the doctrine of repentance, faith in Christ, the Son of the living God, and of baptism and the gift of the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands, when eight years old, this sin be upon the head of, heads of the parents. Well, he said, well, I've taught you the gospel. You know the gospel. Therefore, I'm absolved of anything that you do or are involved in and the responsibility and accountability for what happens to you starts as soon as you're baptized. And so at that point, I started praying to God that as soon as I was baptized, that I would be killed in the car coming home from the baptism because I didn't know how big my window of opportunity would be mm -hmm. before he touched me again and I won and I knew no unclean thing could enter the kingdom of God and I wanted to make sure I was clean and so I so started you preparing. knew you knew that what he was doing to you was unclean you knew that yes. if that's what you were wishing yes you yes knew that something was wrong well now he officiated okay this puts the blame on him Right. In your mind, it has to, be, at least before you were eight years old. Right. And so he officiated at your baptism ritual. Didn't you cr uh, question the validity of his worthiness to baptize you? I did, and that's one of the rationalizations I used in my little eight-year-old mind when I made it home safely from my baptism and God didn't take me. Um, I thought, well, maybe it's because the baptism didn't work because my dad wasn't really worthy to do it. Therefore, I really wasn't clean. 
and therefore I couldn't go to heaven and I couldn't be with God again and maybe God didn't even want me there because I was so unclean and and so that all played into wow wow well, did you go into depression points of depression oh. during this time of, of, of your life oh yes I've been depressed most of my life yeah, that would be so contradictory, living contradictory in your own mind of what he was doing to you and what God might have wanted and being clean and being unclean and 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 you were you had no control over any of it. Right, right. Okay, um, what about as you appro approached um, puberty, 13 years old, dangers of getting pregnant over this, through this? Yes. Uh, what did you or he do or say about it? I became very apprehensive. He was anxious for me to hit puberty. He kept talking about the day that I would finally be a woman. And I was terrified of the day I would finally be a oh. woman and uh, because I was fearful of getting pregnant. Um, he utilized some things that would help prevent that, but I was still fearful that it wouldn't work and I would get pregnant and then I didn't know how I would explain that pregnancy in the church and in my family and to my friends and what would happen to the baby if I got pregnant mm -hmm. and if it was a girl would he start molesting her and so a lot of fear and anxiety came with um, adolescence. So what did he do to prevent the pregnancy if I can ask? He taught me how to use condoms. Okay. now. You were a teenager, and you were going mm -hmm. to church. You were going mm -hmm. to, the, the, to the women's and, and the teenage um, um, activities yes. and so on. Did anybody wonder, see that there might be something wrong with you, with depression or anxiety or whatever? Anybody ask you any questions or have any curiosity or maybe wondering if something was wrong in your home? No, nobody seemed to pick up. It wasn't on anybody's radar. I would sit in those lessons and, and hear the talks on chastity and, and being morally clean with boys when you started dating. And I kept waiting for them to say something about fathers. And that never came up in our young women hmm. lessons. Wow. Now dating, I know I may be getting a little bit ahead of this, but in fact, I don't think we discussed this part, but dating, were you allowed to date when you got old enough, or did your father forbid it? Um, I, in LDS church, you don't date until you're 16, and my parents divorced when I was you 15. Were, you were, okay, that's, yeah. that kind of, we went a little bit ahead on that, yeah. but it just came <laughs> to my mind. So he was committing incest with you and with your younger sister, who was three years younger than you. Did yes. he also, are there any other victims that you're aware of that for sure you know that he uh, molested? Yes, I've... I've had people tell me specifically, first person account of him molesting them. I have two cousins that are older than me, a cousin about my age, and my two younger brothers. Wow. So they, they all admitted to you that he had molested yes. them. Yes. Uh, what about your cousins? How did he have access to them? They were my babysitters. So as when he would go pick them up and bring them to the home to tend me, he would um, molest them in the car to and from babysitting. And one was your age and? No, those were the two that were older than me. Uh -huh. And then the one that was my age whenever she would come to visit from out of state. Yeah, and they never told anybody? My one cousin did tell my grandparent, her parents and my grandparents when I was still an infant. And uh, my father said it was a misunderstanding, and so they decided to just drop it and move forward from That's there. That's a convenient word, isn't it? Yeah. Um, there was a part of uh, fear talking about disobeying your father and being under Satan's power if you do disobey because of that disobedience. Um, and, and he used that in your submitting to the incest. Um, and again, this is how Mormon doctrine can be so destructive. Would you explain that more clearly, to how that affected you? Well, if, if you were obedient and respectful and did as you were told, then uh, you pleased God. If you were angry or contentious or complaining, then you were serving Satan, serving the devil. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to be part of the eternal family and live in the celestial kingdom for eternity, then you needed to obey God, which meant obey your earthly father as 
you would obey your heavenly father. And he used that as his coercion, as part of his coercion. Yes. To get you to submit to this abuse. Yes. Um, let's, let's move to some of the doctrinal items at this point uh, uh, in Mormonism. And we'll get to more in, in, in the next couple of shows as well. But right now, the very fact that he was a priesthood holder, um, what, how did he use that? Did he lord it over you? He used the authoritative control rod. How did he use his priesthood authority? What did he say? What did he, how did he approach with that? Well, he was the priesthood holder, the patriarch. I had to completely submit to him. He would um, put his temple recommend on the end table by the bed. Um, he would be wearing his temple garments prior to the abusive episodes oh, happening. Lord. So it was very much, this is, this is priesthood power, priesthood authority, and I have it, you don't, and you obey me. Um, and so you were commanded to honor the priesthood through that, and he speaks for God. Did he ever use that, I speak for God, you do, obeying me is obeying God? That's, that's what um, most priesthood holders use mm -hmm. is that the, the priesthood power is the authority to speak and act on God's behalf. So now he used this as a coercion. Why? Did you fight him? Did you, were you compliant all the time? Did you, did you argue with him? You don't want to do this anymore? How, yes. Why did he have to use this on you? The older I got and um, the more increased risk of pregnancy, the more I tried to resist and make myself unavailable. And um, that's when he started bringing in some of the temple symbols and covenants and um, other things to justify what he was doing. Now explain when he, if, if you can, in your mind and in your heart, when he used these priesthood holder, patriarch, obey me, obey God, I'm the God's mouthpiece. What did this do inside of you? I mean, tell me how you felt. Uh, very confused because if, if this was truly okay with, with God, then I, I should feel okay with it. And, and I didn't. So then I wondered, okay, is there something wrong with me? Um, is there something I don't understand? And if this is in keeping with God's will, what kind of God is this? Yeah, and unfortunately that happens to so mm -hmm. many people. I know I've talked to people that come out of polygamy groups and they have been abused by brothers and, and uncles and, and just different people. And they come out hating God simply because what kind of a God would do this? Why? Why? What about your sister? Did you and her ever sit and talk privately or secretly about the, the experiences that you were going through? No, we really didn't compare notes. We, we did once as an adult, as adults, we sat down and, and kind of compared some of the things that happened. But during the time it was happening, we, we didn't talk about it. She was angry at me because I wasn't protecting her. Whenever he would get to her, it was my fault because I was the oldest one. I was supposed to be protecting her and she was the fallback choice. So we didn't have a very good relationship mm -hmm. growing up and mm -hmm. it's just deteriorated yeah, over, the over the years. And back to your mother, she said, if it ever happens again, be sure and let me know. And you never told her. Did she ever come to you and wonder or ask you? I don't remember her coming back. Uh, only when my sister would tell, would she come back and say, is this still going on? And I would say yes, and uh, but then nothing ever happened. Then the threats with my dad would increase. Oh. So I just had to make myself more available so my sister was protected and would keep her mouth shut and all my hard work wouldn't be undone. Oh my goodness, that, that's quite a, a thing for a young girl to have. Obedience is a big deal, I know in in the Mormonism and also in the polygamy groups, obey without question, obey um, 
In fact, we were told growing up that, that if, even if the person over you tells you to do something and it's wrong, you obey them and you'll be blessed and then they'll get in trouble for, right. for trying to get you to do what's wrong. But we are to obey even if it's wrong. Did right. they use that rationalization on yes, you? Yes, my, my father did a lot. He said, if, if there is something wrong with this and God is not happy with this, I'll take the blame and you'll be blessed for being obedient. But at the same time, he was blaming you. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> and you would get in trouble if you ever told and, and anything came of it that would hurt him. Right. That's why I couldn't figure out what I was supposed to do. What yeah. did God want me to do? What was I accountable for? How much say did I have in this? Which in my mind, I didn't have any say because I had been groomed for this since infancy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just wanted to be a good, obedient girl and try to earn God's love. Try to get back into His good graces some, somehow. Did you, so you thought you were out of God's good graces through this? Oh, did, definitely. Did you, um, did you try to earn your father's love other than the, for, as a sexual object? Um, or was that even part of your relationship? I, he, he was a good dad when other people were around, like in public. I loved sitting on his lap when we were in public. I loved um, hugging him and getting hugs from him in public. It was our private life that was completely different. It's like a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde type mm. personality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, did you dread to see your father come home from work? Was that something you hated oh, to see? Oh, yes. And that's why I hated the primary song that said, I am so glad when daddy comes home. It's like, no, I don't want him to come home. And uh, another primary song we sang was, um, when my father calls me, quickly I'll obey, for father knows just what is best each and every day. So, I was getting uh, taught in church, in primary, and in family home evening, and in the home, that obedience was number one mm -hmm. no matter what yeah no matter what and we're and also in in a, a future show we're going to talk about some of the scriptures that they use um, to to force you that God wants you to obey as well so um, during all this trauma did you ever feel that God forsake you or did you blame him for the, con the continuing abuse were you walking around in pain and shame from this Definitely. And I thought if if this was truly a loving father, then he would rescue me. He would stop this from happening. Uh, he would make it better somehow. And uh, but it went on. I, I my prayers to die continued. I'd walk across the street saying, let this car hit me. And it didn't. Mm -hmm. And so it's just like he doesn't love me. Yeah, that's, that too often is what happens. You know, uh, we uh, need to stop the right now. We're getting short on time, but we're going to do this next time. And, you know, it is too often the things like this are blamed on God. But you know what? God never condones abuse. Jesus warned actually about the certain dangers of harming children. And the only hope for abusers is biblical repentance, possible only because Jesus died for that sin on the cross. Repentance is defined as going your way and turn, stop going your way to turn and go God's way. See you next time for part two of Vicki's story on polygamy. What love is this? Mm -hmm.